as a chairman of the department, when you were doing your budget of people affiliated at the university, at the university museum and the, and the anthropology department, how did you do it? It was two separate budgets or one budget? Um, oh, I hope I can remember it clearly and explain it. Okay. But um, <clears throat> after the, um, the rapprochement between the university museum and the rest of the university, uh, as I explained before, at least as far as the anthropology department went, uh, there was a policy of, of granting joint titles in both the academic department and as a curator of something in the university museum. Some of the university museum personnel were still paid on a university museum budget. Uh, at least part of them um, on a so-called um, uh, Department of Archaeology budget in the graduate school when the graduate school still had its own budget. Uh, the rest of the faculty were listed uh, on the School of Arts and Sciences, the college budget. Uh, the dean, the deans who kept rotating in and out, didn't really understand which which people would be paid on the museum budget and the anthropology department budget. They were all listed as in the anthropology department, uh, but but they weren't all paid from the anthropology department. Uh, the university also uh, granted or budgeted funds for the uh, university museum curators. Um, so th this always led to a question: Is the university museum really part of the anthropology department or the anthropology department really part of the university museum or what is the relationship between the two? I, I not having been responsible for budgets for the last uh, nearly 20 years, I don't really know how, how this is managed right now. But at the time, it was, it was un, unclear really what the relationship financially was. Did you experience any conflict or controversial issues such as that a curator uh, being dismissed from the university uh, uh, university museum and the conflicts in the one if they are hired through the University of Pennsylvania and if it's tenure yes he cannot be asked to leave right correct but what happened if there was problem at the university museum with a certain individual as a curator that they don't want him anymore can this person be dismissed or well, my understanding of the way it was then, I really can't speak to uh, Bob Dyson's uh, practice now, but my understanding at that time was that all curators had to be processed by the um, university's uh, faculty uh, personnel committee, uh, and that meant that they eventually received their appointment. Uh, through the provost's uh, staff conference and eventually from the president's office or from the board of trustees, really, uh, just as any other faculty member in sociology or physics or what have you. Uh, but that meant uh, that uh, tenure rules applied. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, that grated a little bit on the nerves of uh, Froelich Rainey <laughs> uh, because he was to some extent, losing control over the direction of a program. Uh, if, he, if they wanted to end a program in, in Africa, let's say, because it wasn't productive, uh, and the uh, curator of African studies had tenure, they couldn't do anything about it uh, unless they raised money for uh, uh, other purposes directly from their own constituency, which the University Museum was free to do. It could raise and does raise, as I understand it, funds for expeditions uh, quite independently of university financing procedures. But, the, but their curators are members of the faculty, and faculty rules apply, specifically tenure rules. As a chairman of the department, do you have, yes, I think so. You have to deal with Vartan Gregorian? Things oh, yes, Gregorian. yes. Can you well, tell me not as Vartan chairman, but as, uh, ch as faculty. As faculty? Yes. Delightful person. I mean, really terrific. I, I really liked uh, dealing with him. 
Um, <clears throat> I, he w was very quick. He was uh, very pleasant with with faculty, and I think everybody, I think many people felt that way too. That he was, he exuded a kind of personal friendliness and warmth that uh, made people uh, feel comfortable, and. Um, I think he, he also was a highly competent administrator, a good fundraiser, uh, and an understanding, uh, an understanding executive, uh, a very efficient, efficient person. So uh, there certainly was a strong faculty constituency when the question of who should be appointed uh, the next president, a uh, strong faculty constituency that, uh, that favored him. If there was a, a strong faculty constituency, how then the, the decision of to name a president and a provost is different than the other inputs? Is I would different. assume that the uh, the legal responsibility rests with the board of trustees, um, who uh, have who will take into account information from a variety of sources. I'm sure they're not uh, they're not oblivious to and would seriously consider how the faculty felt. I just don't know the inside uh, of these transactions, uh, but uh, uh, certainly it is not something that, that the faculty has uh, the right or the power to simply elect uh, a president. Uh, you, let's go back, in, let's come back into a, the time period, the 60s. The universe, the type of students. Mm -hmm. When you were here as a student, do they have a lot of social? Do you see a lot of social awareness about the student or political awareness among the students? I don't. I. I don't. I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't have thought so. I, among the veterans, uh, the veterans had sort of, <laughs> sort of had it with the rest of the world by that time, and I think were anxious to get on with their lives. Uh, I remember in the 19, as the, as the Cold War ground on, and it became apparent that, that uh, atomic weapons were proliferating and there was a real uh, concern about the possibility of uh, a, sh a shooting war involving nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union. Uh, everybody was concerned. Um, at, at that time, I, I was, I guess I, when I was in the Behavioral Research Council, for instance, I was on uh, a committee on disaster studies of the National Research Council, which is an arm of the National Academy of Sciences. They were busy studying natural disasters in the United States and elsewhere uh, to as models for what could happen if an atomic attack on the United States occurred. And the results of all of this were, were eventually brought to the National Security Council. and. And I would believe, I don't know what really went on, but I would believe on the basis of those and other studies, it became apparent that, that um, the major issue then was evacuation of cities, that evacuation of cities in advance of uh, the arrival of an atomic weapon was impossible and the wrong thing to do. So that had everybody concerned. It was not so much a kind of political awareness, but an awareness of um, my God, is this starting all over again? Um, and I know I was alarmed and wondered what if, <clears throat> what would happen if I got drafted a second time. Um, I went and talked to Carlton Kuhn, and he told me scary stories about World War II, about a, an anthropologist named George Devereaux, who was also in the uh, culture and personality field and had done some good work on Mojave Indians in the American Southwest, and he. He said, no, I can, I can take care of you, Tony. He said, no, well, there's another one of these guys in culture and personality named George Devereaux. And what we did with him in the OSS was drop him into Indochina. And he sat there with a radio for two years, dodging the Japanese. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I went to the wrong, to the wrong source of information here. And <laughs> oh, dear. <clears throat> so. Fortunately, the crisis went by, and I didn't have to do field work in Indochina. But, uh, <clears throat> but 
But anyway, that, that was a different kind of um, campus, I think, than what developed in the 60s. With the 60s, the Korean War was over, uh, which precipitated all this concern that I was talking about. Korean War had gone past. Uh, it was a semi-legitimated war because of the involvement of the United Nations. Um, and then Vietnam came along, and, and it was difficult for anybody to find much, much reason for the increasing, the escalating involvement of the United States in, in Vietnam. And of course, along with that, then it did become a period of, of campus and countrywide protest. And uh, so that was a very different kind of student atmosphere, and it certainly affected all all departments. What sort of atmosphere was then during the 60s when they were? Well, it, it was an acrimonious atmosphere. Um, there, there was factionalism within the ranks of faculty. Uh, it is an unpleasant time to remember. There were faculty members who tried to get rid of graduate, radical graduate students. Uh, there were faculty members who tried to get rid of conservative uh, fellow colleagues on campus. Uh, it was a, a time of um, infighting and back, back, backstabbing. Um, and of course, constant protests and pressure from, from students on administration, with administration then feeling that it was forced to uh, make compromises. Uh, and uh, it was a time of uh, great concern about the involvement of um, the CIA, for instance, in, and the military in the um, conduct of, of research on campus. And it led, quite properly, to the university backing off from accepting as much money from um, military uh, sources as it had in the past for research across the board, whether it be in physics or the social sciences. But at, at that time, it was, um, I don't know whether it's possible now, but at that time, it was possible for, for instance, for a graduate student to get a, or a recent faculty member to get a grant directly from the Defense Department to do research in some place like Ethiopia or some other place where uh, US strategic interests might in the future be involved. And while the research itself would be perfectly legitimate and straightforward and competent, uh, it obviously also, um, that was an investment in um, in national security. Um, I happen to believe that a country has to have um, has to look after its national security by knowing what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, but I'm not convinced that the way to do that is to enlist the services of of uh, universities or students. So all of that kind of tension was was. Um, was abroad on, on the campus, and not just in anthropology. This would be, I'm sure, all departments would be affected by this in one way or another. You experienced some of the students, the bachelor <coughs> students, coming to you and discuss about their views and things like that? A few would certainly would talk with me sometimes because uh, uh, their situation required talking to the chairman. Uh, uh, I don't think I experienced real, any real personal confrontations with with students, but um, there were there were students who were very actively involved in in protests, uh, and um, a chairman had to be aware as much as he could of of what the how shall I put this what the forces were at work within the department that had a bearing on the on the future careers of graduate students who could get hurt in the process. Have you heard some from some of your students? Do you get some contact with them? Occasionally, not much from that far back, but um, I, I do hear from, I, well, I hear mostly from students who have um, been uh, have done graduate work with me, particularly those who've done uh, dissertations, and um, relatively few 
I don't think many from uh, who I simply knew as someone who came in and talked to me for 10 minutes as, a, as the chairman or in, a, in an undergraduate class. How was the women? Uh, there were percentage of women in your department. I think anthropology has always had a high percentage of uh, women, particularly among graduate students and um, among the sciences and the social sciences. I think there have been probably proportionally more women in anthropology than almost any other field. Uh, there are currently uh, complaints uh, that the proportion of women in faculty members is too low. Uh, statistically, it probably is. Uh, what concerned me when I was chairman was, although I would offhand guess that 40 or 50 percent of the graduate students were women, that there was an incredible dropout rate. Um, and I was, I was never able really to understand what the reason for it was, but it happened often enough for me to feel concerned about what must have been happening, that um, perfectly competent people would come in and start out in the direction of a PhD with no obvious reason, not, not married, not caring for children, um, and in one way or another simply dropped out. They reached a certain stage uh, in their coursework and never got to do their field work or never got to take the final examination and time would go on and eventually they would they would be dropped um, and I don't know what you know what the process is but it it concerned me that there seemed to be a higher dropout rate for women than there was for men there was also some some controversial issues in here I don't know whether you you experienced that when there were a fear of the cold cold war, the McCarthyism, the mm -hmm. the fish, the, the you yeah. had any experience through your colleagues on that? Or how was the atmosphere at the University of Pennsylvania? Well, I, that became intensely personal for me. Uh, I was. Um, what what became intensely? Uh, McCarthy, personally, um, the. Um, I was working for a group of lawyers who were trying cases for something called the Indian Claims Commission. The Indian Claims Commission was empowered by Congress to hear lawsuits by Indian tribes to, to be paid adequately for land that they had sold in the past, uh, say in the 1820s, 1830s, way back, all over the United States. And I was doing research and serving as an expert witness for this group covering most of the Northeast and a lot of territory. And I hired a graduate student from the anthropology department who um, uh, did a lot of the um, library research on old records bearing on the location of villages and hunting grounds. And uh, one morning <clears throat> I read in the paper that um, that uh, Senator McCarthy had named her father as one of the leading communists in, in Philadelphia. <laughs> and um, I'd never been interested in what her own political opinions were. But the uh, people on the other side of this uh, lawsuit was the Justice Department. So I thought, oh boy, um, I, then I was concerned what in the world is going to happen. Nothing happened. I talked to my lawyers and they said, well, don't worry about it. Uh, nothing happened. And as a matter of fact, most of the, it uh, turned out, for some inexplicable reason, most of the um, radical left-wing uh, graduate students who are working as researchers were working for the Justice Department. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, anyway. That made me take a personal interest in, in Senator McCarthy, and I, at one point, decided I've got to see this for myself, and took a train to Washington and saw Senator McCarthy holding one of his hearings in the, one of the Senate hearing rooms. <laughs> Nothing very exciting, but uh, it was really, it was really, kind of a scary time. And <clears throat> I, I predicted, and I was right, 
that eventually the Republican Party itself would have to disgorge McCarthy, that he was going to become a kind of a, a loose cannon on the deck and discredit everybody around him. And eventually, of course, that really did happen. And there were the, the famous hearings and, uh, in which McCarthy's conduct and the, the qualities of his uh, investigative talents were revealed. A minor footnote to this, the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, this issue has an article in it on uh, the drug enforcement uh, in which the author uh, incautiously declared that Senator McCarthy was, a, uh, was addicted to morphine. And it turns out it is not true. Uh, and and he, uh, the author, uh, is going to print a retraction. So McCarthy continues to be a, uh, a controversial person. Talking about, there is always controversial issues. Um, and it seems that it repeats again um, through here, throughout. This is talking about minorities, minority groups being mm -hmm. elected. Uh, when you came on the, as a student, 48th, uh, did you notice that there were very few minorities in here, or blacks? I'm not talking about black Chicanos, Latin Americans. You know. Well, um, I guess I would, there weren't in, when I was there, there were few, and still are, a few blacks in anthropology, um, I, I, in part, I think, because it's not a field in which you can easily learn, earn a living unless you want to work as a college professor. Um, there had been some blacks, uh, students, black Africans, uh, students of Frank Speck. Uh, and Kruma, I think, was a student of Specs and uh, another leader of a, a black African country uh, after the war was a student of his. There were very few uh, American blacks. Uh, one wrote, um, one student wrote a book, still in print, I think, called Black Gods of the Metropolis, another, in fact, revitalization movement kind of subject. Um, but there weren't many blacks. And at, at that time, I think there were re far fewer uh, sp you know, Spanish-speaking uh, people in Philadelphia and in general, I think, outside of the Southwest. Um, so I don't think there were many, if any, m minorities in, in that, either black or Chicano or Spanish-speaking in general. I'm sure there are now. There are more, certainly more. Uh, blacks and, and more um, Spanish-speaking students. Because there are still, you know, there is always in the DP about the, the students, the black students protesting about not having uh, the correspondent rights and voice and uh, still going to that. I, I know there's, there's a lot of controversy right now, and I, I gather there's a kind of uh, white um, backlash type thing with racial incidents on campus that um, that I don't remember anything of that sort happening back then. Um, I don't think that if a if a black student applied uh, for to come into the graduate school, there would have been any. I mean, it would depend on on grades and interest and recommendations, and uh, I don't think it would have made any difference at all, really. One other thing, another uh, issue that was, um, that I think he has going to the other extreme now, um, that was the inbreeding. And there was a question in inbreeding uh, very much indeed at the University of Pennsylvania. That'd be a classic example. Could you tell me <laughs> what inbreeding? Um, well, in, in the sense that um, I was a student of Spex uh, and Hallowells and so on and have con yeah. continued that tradition. I think it's partly a, how, how, how much this becomes a, a, a tradition on a campus. If it happens repeatedly, it's going to be very, extremely difficult to, for a department 
a field to change directions, perhaps, and keep up with, with things that are happening new, especially now, because of uh, simply the, num the, the large number of people who have tenure. Um, in anthropology, over the past few years, uh, gradually, almost everybody within the department has come to have tenure, so that, and the size of the department is not expanding. At that point, you can't appoint new personnel. If you want to bring people in who are interested in something that's going on in anthropology, that, and you don't have people who are doing that right now, there are no slots. You have to wait until somebody retires or dies. So a lot um, of the of the of the of the uh, faculty member were paying students. So besides you, part of that in breeding. They were well, they, when when we were building up, um, I don't know that we concerned ourselves especially ab about it, but I think the policy that uh, everyone would follow is you get the best person that you can get wherever they come from. Uh, if the best person in a particular field that you want to have represented in your department happens to have been trained in your department, you go and ha hire him <laughs> too or her. But uh, it's it, with an expanding department, uh, it is, this is, is a non-problem. We started out, let's say, with uh, three or four faculty in 19, 46 or 47, within uh, 15 years or so, we had something in the order of 22 or 23, including, including museum personnel. Um, expanding like that, uh, it, it is not difficult to say, well, we need somebody in this field, or we need, we need at least two Africanists. We don't have any right now, so we're going to find Africanists. And if they come there, if, it's an, if we haven't had an Africanist program, we're not going to hire anybody from our own uh, pool of graduate students or recent PhDs. We'll try to steal them away from, from uh, a place that is producing Africanists. When you have a very, a, a very um, outstanding student, graduate student who decides to leave, to go to Harvard, to go to whatever, mm -hmm. and there is, is there an attempt, for instance, when there is an opening f to bring to bring that student? Or it certainly can. Faculty? It certainly can happen. I wouldn't hesitate to do it. Uh, I can think of two or three people like that that uh, <clears throat> they become outstanding in their field, and it's a it's a specialty that we also practice. Uh, uh, then I would say, gee, we'll go after him as as hard as we can. It becomes kind of an added qualification, perhaps, that uh, he or she was was away for three, four, or five, six years uh, and has learned some, something about another department and somewhat different points of view. I think that, that is an advantage. Um, but uh, I mean, we'd, I'm sure we'd, we've gone after the people that we thought were best. We, and, I've never knowingly gone after someone just because he was an old uh, graduate student of our, ours or an old crony. Okay, where were you? A moment ago, you were you were raising the um, a general question about uh, the, the way in which the university, back in earlier times when I was uh, chairman, uh, interacted with the uh, community in West Philadelphia. Um, and that brings to mind uh, an, uh, an abortive experience. Um, I was um, uh, asked to chair a committee to uh, study the question of how the university could help uh, the uh, help to improve the education, the public education, and private education. Uh, opportunities off campus for residents of Fe West Philadelphia, uh, some of them being university families and others uh, simply uh, residents in the neighborhood. And um, we came together over the course of several months and um, pointed out that uh, it 
as many people would agree, it would not be a good thing for the university to become a kind of fortress uh, with uh, walls and police and a defended boundary uh, in the midst of hostile territory in West Philadelphia, uh, and that we really needed to uh, do as much as we, as we could to um, um, help West Philadelphia in ways that West Philadelphia felt that they needed some help that we could give. Uh, so we recommended that the university not merely encourage its faculty to volunteer as um, faculty aides in public school and so on, but to uh, commit a small amount of money uh, to on a, on a regular budgeted basis. And I, I think we were thinking in terms of something like a hundred thousand dollars a year to uh, to various possible. Uh, projects uh, that would aid and improve uh, the educational opportunities for people in, in our area. And that proposal sank like a lead balloon. Uh, the, um, the president reportedly said, now we have Tony's report, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> and so nothing, uh, the, nothing really in that uh, came, came of it at all. The university wasn't prepared at that time to commit itself institutionally to, how would you put it, to that kind of formal supportive interaction with the sur surrounding lay community, although informal support from faculty, from graduate students and others certainly w was encouraged. I don't know how wise our proposal was. Uh, it certainly would be a precedent that might be hard to uh, to live up to, uh, that it might create expectations that the university couldn't fulfill. Uh, so. When was that? When well, that would have been way back in the 1960s sometime. Um, by now, I really don't remember the name of the committee or most of who my fellow committee members were. But it, um, it pointed out to me the uh, the tension involved within the university over policies that, that involve doing things other than a university's primary mission, which certainly is not to be a settlement house, so to speak, but to uh, teach graduates and undergraduates and, uh, and do research. That's what a university basically is for, but, it, but nevertheless, it can't av avoid uh, being conscious of where it is and the fact that it has neighbors uh, and that uh, a university needs to be a good neighbor. Did he give you reasons or anything? You just let it go? Well, I, I spoke to the, um, to the faculty senate on, to, on the presentation of the report and uh, most of the people who who rose and spoke were unsympathetic to the idea. I think on on, this, on the grounds that I just expressed that that uh, they argued passionately that the university's mission is to do research and to train people, uh, and uh, that it should not involve itself as uh, in should not commit its resources uh, in a, the sense of a budget to. Um, practical enterprises out on behalf of uh, a surrounding community. Now that, of course, didn't mean that the university would be un unfriendly in response to requests to, uh, to have expert faculty uh, given leave of absence, let's say, to advise the mayor on, on transportation problems or, or what have you. But uh, no, I, I felt it was a kind of a, a naughty a naughty problem to, and I, I don't really know what the university's policy has been since. I think since then, uh, the population on campus has increased and economic conditions in West Philadelphia have not improved that much. And uh, there's been a, an increasing consciousness of, of uh, danger on campus from thefts and assaults. And I'm sure the university is spending more now on security than, than than $100,000 a year. But um, 
whether the kind of uh, program that um, that we had in mind would would really have uh, made any difference in <clears throat> in all of that. I, I couldn't possibly say. And I felt awkward anyway in in the position of recommending this because I did I lived 20 miles away in uh, in Delaware County, and so I I couldn't. I couldn't claim to be an expert on on uh, what West Philadelphia needs. Going, we're going to wrap it up. If we go back to, um, I'm going to, to be wrapping it up, closing the statement with three questions. Uh, to the question of uh, what would you consider your fondest memory when you, as a student? at the University of Pennsylvania when you came as an undergraduate or as a graduate student? <laughs> oh, probably going up to um, that old office of Frank Specks and, <clears throat> um, and chatting with Speck and... You have to state it with my fondest memory. You have my to my fondest memory of uh, undergraduate days uh, would be, I think, uh, um, Climbing the stairs up to the fourth floor of College Hall, arriving out of breath, <laughs> and uh, coming in and and uh, chatting with uh, with Speck and with uh, other other students and um, in some sort of a, not something not even as formal as a seminar about Speck uh, Speck's experiences and American Indian studies. So he was that. That I, yes, he was a real, uh, uh, I have very fond memories of Speck. He died, I think, while I was still a graduate student. Um, but um, every, I think everybody remembers him with, you know, with the same kind of affection. <clears throat> now, what about when you were a faculty and a chairman? Well, <laughs> what is my fondest administrative memory? <laughs> I think um, I think basically uh, realizing when I was in conferring with Goddard, uh, David Goddard as as provost early on, perhaps in the 19, 1962 or 63, just before I became chairman, that he was offering me a blank check. Uh, that I could structure an anthropology department as I thought one should be structured, that there were no, uh, there were no strings attached, um, and that um, sooner or later money would be forthcoming. Um, and uh, I really had a kind of gee whiz <laughs> feeling this is not going to happen again. So uh, I think that was a, <clears throat> that was a thrill. So now, two questions about university. Uh, if someone would ask you, what's the strength of the University of Pennsylvania, what would you say the strength of Penn? Well, I think it's a combination of, of diversity and equality in very diverse fields, uh, fields that may not interact with each other as, as often as one would think ideal, um, but which provide a kind of an an atmosphere of of, uh, of quality. The um, I think the university has has shared with other American universities over the past since World War II um, in a gigantic growth, and the anthropology department has certainly benefited from that. So uh, the the general improvement in in both quantity and quality of programs in in the university is conspicuous in, uh, in my memory. And um, I think the University of Pennsylvania now has, a, has been recognized as one of the, a, re one of a really world-class university. And when I first got here, it was kind of a rather sleepy uh, Ivy League college uh, with lots of potential. Now, what about the weakness? If, if you see any weakness, do you see any weak, weakness of Pennsylvania? Just the strength? Well, um, 
in the past few years, I haven't been involved in administrative things, and uh, and I haven't tried to. I've been keeping a low profile, but um, I think one weakness is uh, there's a. How should I put this? There's an awful lot of rancorous politics, um, and that. It sort of diminishes the quality of life, I think, on campus. Um, I think it's. I think I mentioned that there was a lot of rancorous politics in the 1960s, uh, and perhaps some of the same issues are really alive today, and they're issues that have to be addressed on any campus and throughout the society. Uh, uh, the uh, issues of uh, uh, minorities. Participation in university life, uh, uh, issues of uh, uh, the representation of women in, in faculty uh, and administration, and all of these can generate and will generate controversy and difficulties in implementing policy. But I, there, one can't expect all of that to go away. Now, when do you retire? I retired last year. Last year? Yes. What are you doing now? Well, I'm trying to clean out my office. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, got four, I've been a pack rat, and I've got 40 years' worth of accumulation in my office, and two offices in the University Museum. I've been cleaning, cleaning out my files. A lot of my papers and uh, research papers are going down to the library of the American Philosophical Society, and that takes some, some sorting through. And um, I'll, I'm looking forward to getting on to doing some writing once I get myself cleared out and relocated. The Philosophical Society, do you have, do you know in a close way Dr. Steller? Well, I don't, I can't say I know him in a close way. He's, um, I meet him regularly at the Society now, and um, uh, I knew him as a, uh, a professor of psychology and uh, later as the provost, of course. Um, and he's someone I think we all respect. Jonathan Rhodes, another uh, uh, former provost, I believe he followed Lauren Isley, as a matter of fact, and who has also been active at the American Philosophical Society. And I noticed as one of the managers of the University Museum he wrote an article. Did you see it in the Almanac about retirement? retirement? No, I don't think I did see it. Yes. I think I want to try to give it to you. Oh, I, I'll look. About retirement at 70, he talks about that. Uh-huh. He reads, he writes about the issue of retirement at 70. Do you believe on retirement at 70? Well, what is your feeling of a person being asked to retire at 70? Well, I think that depends really on, on the... Um, I can see some reasons for trying to terminate faculty at some date simply to provide spots for new blood, uh, and I can I can understand a policy of that kind. On the other hand, if a, if a person is is physically active and uh, mentally alert and keeping up with his field, it seems a shame to lose a talented and experienced faculty member simply in order to create a small void and save a little money. It's, uh, uh, there ought to be some flexibility in that. Now, I'd, I know I've retired at 65. I just programmed myself years and years ago to feel that 65 was the age at which I was going to retire, and that's what I did. But. Which is great. Well, anyway, I, I will leave you the, um, the article for you to read of okay, Jonathan I'll, Rhodes. Okay, I'll look beautiful. forward to that. Uh, anything else that you would like to cover? Anything that we have? I think you've done a marvelous job of uh, touching on the uh, things that were at the top of my mind, too. So <laughs> my compliments to you. Oh, thank you.